Good morning. Let's start with a question this morning. If you're hungry, which would you prefer? Would you prefer an MRE or uh, a Twinkie? Um, I don't know if it's, any of you recognize what's in the center of that picture there. Uh, those are the old, uh, they used to call them sea rations. And uh, matter of fact, I, I've had those before too. And this, um, Actually, not too bad. Um, and when you think of these foods uh, that are meant to uh, last for a long period of time, especially the ones that are in cans like that, we usually call them uh, non-perishables, right? Uh, but when you think about it, in reality, all food ultimately is perishable because at some point in time, uh, it's going to go bad. Um, it doesn't stay good indefinitely. And uh, we're going to be looking at a discussion in which Jesus talks about imperishable versus perishable food. And uh, so let's take your Bibles and turn to uh, John chapter 6. And this is the uh, miracle where Jesus fed 5,000 people out in the wilderness. And uh, when you're out in the wilderness in, in, uh, in a place like that, with the thousands of people that came to hear him, uh, there were no MREs around or sea rations. There wasn't any food to eat. Can you imagine thousands of people? What are you going to do when people begin to get hungry? And Jesus asked them, where are we going to buy bread so that they may eat? And of course the disciples knew they didn't have enough resources to feed that number of people. It would take 200 denarii. That's the eight months worth of wages. Now you can do the math to figure out about what eight months worth of wages might be. But it's a lot of money to feed thousands of people. And so all they discovered that they had among them was just this little boy. He had a, a child's lunch. Uh, five barley loaves, you know, little, we're not talking big loaves of bread. These are little hand size uh, loaves of bread. Five barley loaves and a couple of fish, uh, probably for lunch. But, uh, and the disciples said, what is that for so many people? That's nothing. They still haven't realized that's all you need. Matter of fact, even if you didn't have that, you still would have enough as long as you have Jesus, the Son of God, with you. But what is that for so many people? And so Jesus says, has a, have everyone sit down. We're going to feed everybody with this child's lunch. And so uh, he fed thousands of people in the wilderness. And the text says that by the time they were done, there were leftovers. Twelve baskets full. And so the people reacted. They responded. Verse 14 of John chapter 6. When the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who was coming to the world. Now that goes all the way back to something Moses said in Deuteronomy. Moses said, the day is coming, someday God is going to raise up another prophet, like me. And you're going to listen to him. And so the people are looking forward to the prophet whom God would raise up and he would lead them. <clears throat> and now here they are again. They're out in the wilderness. They're being fed miraculously. That sounds like what was going on back in the days of Moses. This truly is a prophet who has come to the world. They didn't call him the Son of God. They didn't call him God. They didn't recognize that just yet. And so the text goes on and says, when they realized that this was a prophet, they wanted him to be their leader. And it says they were going to force him to become their king. Now, I don't know exactly how they're going to force them. Maybe they're going to, you know, uh, uh, form this parade and march into the city and say, Hail, uh, uh, Jesus, our King, or something of that nature. But Jesus realized that they were going to do that, and that's not the type of king he was going to be. He didn't come to start a political revolution. He didn't come to start a military revolution. He came to start a revolution of the heart. The best kind and the only true kind of revolution there can be. But he recognized what they are going to do. And so he sneaks away. In fact, the text says, if we continue on in the middle of the chapter, uh, he walks across the lake to the other side. It wasn't frozen. Walks across the other side. And so the people, the crowd, they go looking for him. Finally, they find him out there on the other side of the lake. Rabbi, when did you get here? <coughs> and Jesus says, and Jesus said in verse 26, Truly I say to you, you look for me, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. In other words, when Jesus is doing all of these things, when Jesus is performing these miracles, they were supposed to understand that it wasn't just something that happened that was uh, unusual, but there was supposed to be a message behind it. The fact that he calls it a sign means that it's 
pointing to some lesson, some truth that they were supposed to understand and learn. <coughs> and so we're going to look this morning at what this sign was to say to them and what the sign says to us. So first of all, obviously, Jesus is divine. All of his miracles, you could, put, you could put that as a heading under all of his miracles and all of his signs. They demonstrate that Jesus is not just an ordinary human being, but Jesus came from heaven. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. And this miracle demonstrates it in a very vivid way. you got the miracle itself where Jesus feeds thousands of people in the wilderness with just a handful of food. <coughs> and they were supposed to recognize that this is the sort of thing that God does. But then you notice what he calls himself. He calls himself the Son of Man. Verse 27, it says, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Now what does that phrase, you see that all over in his ministry, he refers to himself consistently more than anything else as the Son of Man. Now I think a lot of us real, uh, recognize that this is a phrase that was used among the Jews to mean human. You're either son of God or you are a son of man, as in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is called son of man by God over and over and over again. But I don't think that's what, matter of fact, I'm confident that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying that he's just a human being. <coughs> when he was arrested and he was before the Jews and they put him on trial and were trying to uh, trump up all of these accusations against him and build a case against him, they ask him, listen to these words, uh, Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 62, the high priest stood up and said to him, how do you answer? What is it that the, uh, how do you answer what these men are testifying against you? And Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, whether you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. Jesus is quoting from Daniel chapter 7, where uh, the Ancient of Days takes a seed, and, this, and one like of Son of Man is coming, and to him was given uh, power and rule and authority, and his kingdom would never come to an end. And everyone rightfully understood that to be a, a passage about <coughs> the Messiah, a passage about divinity, a passage about God. And Jesus here is taking that and applying it to himself. He is the Son of Man. He is the one who is going to have the kingdom which will never be destroyed. And so, since the Jews didn't accept that He was divine, <coughs> they called that blasphemy. And to make it extra clear, at one point in His ministry, <coughs> Jesus said, in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, I say to this paralytic, Take up your bed and walk. I think out of everything that he did, out of all the miracles, the one thing that he did, that he did more than anything else that demonstrates that he is divine, that demonstrates that he is God, is the fact that he forgave sins. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. And that's why they said <coughs> Jesus was blaspheming. Blaspheming, because only God has the authority to forgive sins. And if Jesus was just a human being, then yes, he would be blaspheming. He couldn't forgive people's sins. Only God can do that. But because he was God, he had the authority to forgive sins. And to demonstrate it, he did what the people would consider the harder thing to do. Which is easier, to say, take up your bed and walk, or just to say, your sins are forgiven. I'll do the harder thing so, I, so that I can demonstrate to you that I have the authority to do the forgiveness of sins. And so he calls himself the Son of Man. And uh, that shows his uh, uh, divinity. Jesus also said that he came down from heaven and even said uh, that he has seen God. And uh, that's in verse 38. And then he asks this question, what if you, what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before. In other words, to heaven, the very presence of God. 
And so Jesus is divine. And not everyone in the world accepts that. Matter of fact, some people deny it and do so vehemently. Several years ago, there was a group of uh, seminary students, some of which I was included, um, in a class that went and visited the Islamic Center down in Kansas City. And uh, a tour guide took us to the place. We were trying to understand uh, uh, a little bit more about uh, that particular religion so that we could... Uh, so that could, we could reach people and, and uh, communicate with them and com communicate the gospel. And I remember the guy that took us through the place uh, began to ridicule our idea of God and kept claiming, well, you know, we believe in one God, but you guys, you believe in three gods. And we tried to explain, no, we believe in one God. And she's talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We worship three gods. But in spite of the fact that we tried to explain to her, she still insisted that we believed in three gods. But the thing that really got under our skin for a lot of us, and when she started saying like, who, things like, who in the world would want to worship a God that could bleed and die and, and, uh, and, and do those sorts of things? I mean, your God is weak, but our God, Allah, He is strong and He's noble. And I could visibly see some in the group actually get kind of hot under the collar because that's our Lord and Savior that you're talking about. And what they failed to understand was God's grace, His mercy, and his love, and what that means. You see, when man breaks God's law, because God is righteous, what has to happen? A penalty has to be paid, right? And no man could pay that penalty. Because the Bible says that all have sinned, and all have fallen, short, fallen short of the glory of God, so there's not a single human being of this earth that could pay that penalty. And so what does God do? Becomes a man never sinned, and pays the penalty himself so that we could be reunited with God. Why did he do that? Because he's righteous on one hand, he's just, and on the other hand, he's full of grace and mercy and love, and he's faithful to his promises. And as we stood there listening to this presentation, they bragged about how uh, their God, about how Allah had 99 different names, and they claimed, uh, and one of, the name, uh, one of the names means most loving. And so they said that, you know, our God is most loving, He's merciful, He's kind, and in their scriptures, listen to these words, uh, in their scriptures it says uh, that He's, uh, it refers to Him constantly as Allah, most loving. And there's, but there's a passage in chapter 3 and verse 31 of their scriptures, it says, If you love Allah, Allah will love you. Okay, he'll lo if you love Him, then He will love you. And so He only loves those people who love Him. Another passage says, Allah does not love unbelievers. In other words, He only loves believers. He only loves Muslims. And so when you look at that type of love, the, the uh, commands to fight the unbelievers and the infidels fits with the character of this particular God. I mean, that's the type of God he is. He's very select in who he loves. But our God doesn't just say he's loving. He doesn't just say that he's gracious and merciful. He's demonstrated it. And he demonstrated it in a way that no one could have ever imagined. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9, it does say that he's righteous. It says, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. It doesn't say you loved righteous people and hate lawless people, but it says you hate lawlessness. God hates sin with a passion, but he loves us equally with a passion. John chapter 15 and verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He demonstrated his love for us. Romans chapter 5 says, God demonstrated his love in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not just for good people, but for sinners. You know that passage says some people might dare to die for a really good person. Somebody might dare to die for a righteous person, but Christ, because of His love for us, died for us while we were yet sinners. And then in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, You have heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
Very typical the way the world loves, right? But he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And it goes on and said, He causes the rain to uh, rain on both the just and the unjust. Why should we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us? Because that is what God does. If you want to be sons of God, then you'll love the same way that God does. And God loves even His enemies. And He says, if you don't, what do you dif do differently than everybody else? Isn't that the way everybody else loves? They love only those people who love them. They greet only those people who greet them. But we, because we are sons of God, we love people the same way that God loves us. The Bible also says that if we are faithless, He remains faithful. God could have given up on the world a long time ago, but He never did. He does not give up on us. And so, to state that some other God is loving and merciful rings hollow in light of all of this, right? Those are just words. But God demonstrated His love in deed and in truth. Is it any wonder that so many other people, even people in other religions and false religions, don't truly understand love, mercy, and compassion? Jesus... Someone that they claim was only a man, think about this, they claim he's only a man actually outdid Allah in showing love. He outdid him in showing love. His demonstration of what they call weakness is the greatest demonstration of strength in all human history. No one has been able to demonstrate the type of strength that Jesus did. Imagine demonstrating weakness and it's actually a demonstration of strength. You know, if Jesus were not both God and man, we would have no hope at all in the world. The only way we can even hope to have forgiveness of sins, the only way we can even be hope to be united with God it's through Jesus Christ. You can't find the offer of redemption through a righteous sacrifice, a human righteous sacrifice, from God Himself. You won't find that anywhere else other than in Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 says that He shared in our flesh and blood. He shared in our humanity. He came down from heaven and became a man, and He through his death, defeated the power of Satan. And now because he has walked in our shoes, it says that he has become a merciful and faithful high priest. In other words, we can go to him and he offers forgiveness of sins to us on the basis of his own sacrifice. And so he's not weak at all. And we've seen demonstrations of that throughout his ministry. He tramples the waves of the sea. He casts out demons with a single word. Actually, he casts out demons even without a word in one at one point. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. And even came back from the dead himself. And only he can raise us from the dead. Let me ask a question. Did they take his life when he went to the cross? Sometimes people will talk about they killed Jesus and nailed him to the cross. That's not what Jesus said. He said he laid down his life and he would take it up, take it up again. He has all authority. And even if it seems like somebody else has authority over him, it's only because it's been granted by the Father. But I lay down my own life, he said, and I take it up again. Jesus is divine. He is from heaven. He is God. And so because he is divine, he is also the source of true life. He's the only source of life in the entire universe. You know the beginning of the book of John, right? Where it says, the beginning was the Word, the Word became flesh, uh, and, uh, and uh, all things were made uh, through Him, and it also says that in Him was life. All life comes ultimately from Him, our Creator. And so he drives this point home using that bread in which he fed thousands of people miraculously. He drives that point home using that bread as an object lesson. So let's go ahead and start reading uh, verse uh, 30 of John chapter 6. Verse 30 of John chapter 6. They said to him, What then do you do 
for a sign so that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Okay, so Jesus told them, don't work for the perishable bread, work for the imperishable bread. And so the people say, what sign are you going to give us? Okay, they were looking for something like what their forefathers said. God gave them bread out of heaven. They weren't sure what to call it, so they called it manna, which means what is it? Said, what sort of thing are you going to do? My first reaction when I saw that, what, what did he just do? He just fed thousands of them miraculously, but now here they are asking for uh, another sign. And they said, God gave us bread out of heaven to eat. They didn't realize that God has already been giving them bread out of heaven to eat. And so Jesus drives this point home. He goes on, verse 32. He says to them, Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And so Jesus now is going to compare this manna to himself. Now we know that all their forefathers, they ate manna and they did so for many years in the wilderness. Are any of them around today? No, I don't think you, 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 can't, you find, can't find any of them anywhere in the world today. In other words, they ate that manna and what happened to them? They grew old and they died. Later on in the chapter, at the point Jesus is going to make, make he's going to say, all your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Okay, And so you need something that's going to sustain you that's not like this manna in the wilderness. The Father gives true bread out of heaven and it's going to give true life. And so that's what he tells them. And so they said, verse 34, Lord, always give us this bread. Okay, if we're going to find life from this bread, give us some of that. We want some of that. And what does Jesus say? Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Who come, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. In other words, if you come to me, you'll never go hungry again. You'll never go thirsty again. And we're talking about, and he's not just talking about hunger pangs, he's talking about true hunger, the type of hunger that causes you uh, to starve to death. And he says, you will never go hungry again. I want you to notice a couple of words that he uses here. Okay, and I really want to drive these points home. First is that he calls himself, in verse 51, calls himself the living bread. The bread of life, the living bread. He is the living bread. Now that fits, right? Jesus, is he alive today? We sing the song, I know that Jesus is well and alive today because he died but he rose from the grave and the Bible says that he always lives to make intercession for us and because he always lives he's always helping us he's always speaking to God on our behalf and he's always strengthening us and he gives us life because he lives forevermore he is the living bread he also calls himself the true bread my father gives the true bread out of heaven and Jesus says I am that true bread and then later he says, my, uh, he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And he says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. If you eat of this, you will live. Now, if he is true bread, that implies that there's also what? Implies that there's also false bread, right? There's true bread and false bread. There is perishable and there is imperishable bread. And as I was thinking about this uh, imagery... One of the things came to mind is what I read uh, not too long ago about uh, the USS Indianapolis. Anyone uh, familiar with the story of the U.S.? They actually made a, a movie out of what happened here. This was a, uh, a battleship from World War II. It was uh, sunk by a Japanese, uh, Japanese submarine. And it only took 12 minutes for the ship to go down. And there were nearly 1,200 crewmen on board. And 300 of them went down with the ship. And so that left 900 sailors floating in the water. And the bad thing, and what that makes this story stand out, is the fact that no one knew what had happened. 
It had something to do with they were, with uh, the secrecy of reporting departing ships and arriving ships. And so they departed. They never arrived and it was never reported. And so they stood out. They were floating in the water for four days. And during those four days, 600 of those sailors died from exposure, from sharks, from salt water poisoning and dehydration. The chief medical officer, Lewis Hughes, uh, tells about it. He said, here's part of his words. He says, when the sun, when the hot sun came out, we were in this crystal clear water. You were so thirsty, you couldn't believe that it wasn't good to drink. I had a hard time convincing the men that they shouldn't drink. The real one, young ones, you take away their hope, you take away their water and food, and they drink the salt water. And then they would go fast. I can remember striking men who were drinking water to try and stop them. They would get diarrhea, then get more dehydrated, and then become maniacal. Maniacal. Yeah. And by the time the ordeal was over, they were spotted by a plane going overhead, landed, and some of the men were able to climb up onto the plane, and they sent out word, and ships came and started plucking men out of the water. But the, by the time... It was over. Of those 900 men that went, uh, that went into the water, uh, 317 of them were all that had survived. They were surrounded by seemingly clear blue water, but you couldn't drink it. That stuff was deadly. It would kill you. It was, uh, it was poison to them. And so sometimes the world offers things that looks clear and blue and, refresh, uh, and refreshing, uh, but it, it's anything but refreshing in the end. We need true food, and true drink. And that comes only from Christ himself. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about, you know, what are, what are, what are some of those false drinks and false breads out there? Okay, and there's a lot of things in life that promise to bring some kind of happiness or, or joy, um, but they do anything but. They'll kill you in the end. Look at this one. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 3, The lips of an adulteress drips honey, and smoother than oil is her speech. But in the end, she is as poisonous as wormwood. Don't get mixed up with that. As, as exciting as that may seem, don't even get, go anywhere near with it. Don't even play with it. Or what about this one? Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. That is also a dead end. Jesus told a story once about a man who uh, amassed great wealth in his lifetime. So he's going to store it all up and live the rest of his life. But in the end, his life was taken from him. And then what was going to happen to his riches? It's a dead end. Proverbs 18 and verse 24. A man of too many friends comes to ruin. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so for popularity junkies, this tells us also that that is also a dead end. Or what about this one? Can a man forget her nursing child, or can a woman? Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Now I know uh, family is what's closest to us in the world, but you know even family can fail us as well. That's what those prophet is saying here. They may forget, but God will never forget forget. And even if your family uh, does remain devoted to you, that something may happen that takes their life from you as well. But God, because, but, but, but God and his, his Son lives forever. And He says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Ecclesiastes ch chapter 12 says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Are any of you there yet? You wake up in the morning and, oh, another morning. Do any of you crawl out of bed and your bones creak and crack? Do any of you get out of bed and have to put your teeth on so you can eat your breakfast? Okay, the description in the rest of this chapter describes what happens to your body as a year, as your body, as the years go by and your body gets older, so the, everything begins to wear down and stops working. Therefore, remember your Creator when you're young. Don't wait to the end of life. Because in the very end he says, after uh, engaging in all of this false bread, 
He engaged in all of this false bread and tried to find happiness everywhere, tried to find meaning everywhere except in God. He says, in the end, the only thing that matters, what you are all about, man and woman, is to fear God and keep His commandments. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And so even youth is a dead end. It doesn't last forever. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant living only comes in Christ. And so we must turn to Christ. How do we do that? A lot of people say, I, don't, I, I believe in Christ. I don't have any problems with Jesus. But we need to understand, it's not just about believing that he existed at some time uh, on the earth. It's about devotion to him. And I want to focus, uh, I want to focus on uh, four key words that tells us how to turn to Christ that comes from this passage. Verse 27, Jesus says, Work not for the imperishable, or work not for the perishable, but the imperishable food. Okay, the key word I want to highlight there is work. We must do the works of God. And Jesus says, don't work for what is perishable, but work for what is imperishable. And the people ask, well, how do we do that? We want to do that, but how do we do that? And Jesus' answer to them is to believe in Him whom God has sent. This is what you do in order to do the work of God, is to believe in Him whom God has sent. We need to believe in Christ. We need to have faith in Him. Now, we would have expected a long list, right? What must we do in order to do the work of God? We would have expected things like uh, to serve people or to give alms or to be kind or to love your neighbor or to forgive or don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat and so forth. We would have expected a list but instead Jesus simply says the work of God is for you to believe in Him whom God has sent. And that's significant. Because there are a lot of people who think if you do good works, that's enough. But it's not, not, not about just doing good works. Did you realize that a person could spend his life doing good works and still be lost? That's right. You can still do good works in life and still be lost. The point is love and devotion to Jesus Christ. The point is devotion. It's a relationship with Christ. Accepting Him not only as our Savior, but as our Lord. The other key word, okay, I know there's more than one word, so it's key words, uh, is eat and drink Christ. Later he says that we must eat and drink his uh, flesh and his blood, otherwise we have no life in us. What does that mean? We know it's a metaphor, right? We know that he's talking about uh, being nourished by him, but what exactly does that mean? And here's the final key word. The key word is the word word. Words of life. The disciples understood that Jesus had the words of life. A lot of people left him, but Jesus said, are you going to go too? And he said, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. Jesus said, "My, uh, the flesh profits nothing, but my words, the words that I spoke to you, they are spirit and they are life. Did you realize word, spirit, life, and even breath, all of those are connected together? Uh, just briefly, I want to go ahead and show you what I mean. The words of Jesus are spirit and they are life. And I want to focus just for a minute on this word spirit. Okay? Those are all the ways you see there at the bottom of the screen that that word is translated. It's translated as spirit, capital S. It would also be translated spirit, little s. Uh, breath, blowing, or uh, even the wind. And here's some examples. John chapter 3 and verse 8. Jesus said, the wind blows where it wills and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The word wind and spirit are the same words. Word. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, talk about the two witnesses that were put to death because of their preaching. It says that after they were put to death, the breath of God came into them and they stood up on their feet. That word breath is the same word. Breath. Okay, that's where life comes from. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, I know it's written in a different language, but the same concept is there. After God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, what did he do? He breathed into his nostrils, what? The breath of life. Life comes ultimately from the breath of God or the Spirit of God. And so Jesus' words, he said, they are spirit and they are life. They are God's breath. They are what, give us, they are what gives us life because he has the words of life. And I want to extend this not to what is his words, but also to Jesus himself. 
He is our life. His words are our life and He Himself is our life. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, And we know that life comes from Him, the Word of life. And that's why He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But I want to extend this even further. The written Word of God is our life. There's a passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Some, passage, uh, some translations translate this as all scripture is inspired of God. Now I, I dislike that for one reason because the word inspired is so nebulous as to what the word means. You know, you can look at a sunset and say, sunset and say, oh, that is so inspiring. And I don't th- I know that's not what this is talking about. The word there literally is a compound word, uh, theonustos, theos for God, pneuma for spirit. Or breath. And so some Bibles render it, all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is the breath of God. Life has been breathed into the word of God because it is the word of God into us. If we're going to live, we need to sustain ourselves on the word of God. Maybe think of what we do when we leave our environment. If you go out into space, what do you have to bring with you? You've got to bring your breath with you, right? You've got to bring your air. You've got to bring oxygen. You go out of your environment under the ocean. What do you take with you? You take air with you, right? You take tanks of air because if you don't, that's not, you're not of the ocean. And since you're not of the ocean, you need to have air to breathe. You're not of space. Since you're not of space, you need to have air to breathe. We're not of this world. Therefore, we need to have air to breathe. And that air to breathe, the breath of God comes from Scripture, which He has passed on to us. It is our oxygen. I hope this is going to work. I want you to notice, I'm going to show you a video. And that these are uh, Chinese Christians receiving Bibles for the first time. And I don't know if you know anything about that part of the world, but uh, there are a lot of persecuted Christians there. And for just owning one of these things, you could be put into prison. But I want you to notice their reaction. They received aid, and they finally opened the package full of Bibles. I want you to notice their reaction. The breath of God. The woman in pink, if you're wondering what she said, uh, she said, out of everything we received, this is what we needed the most. I mean, you can receive food, you can receive all kinds of other aid, but this is what we needed the most. This is our life. We can receive all kinds of bread, receive all kinds of uh, false bread, but what matters is the true bread, which is the breath of God. So I want to challenge you this morning, if you haven't already been doing so, to spend time in the Word and don't accept, don't accept substitutes. It's like seawater. It'll kill you. There's a passage, a scripture reading that said, ask the question, why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy And the world offers a whole assortment, a whole smorgasbord of all kinds of these sorts of things. But what really matters is Christ. That's why scripture says, in him you are complete. In him you are complete. If you want to be complete, people look for completeness in all kinds of places. But if you want to be complete, the only place you're going to find that is in Jesus Christ. Now you may feel okay. I don't, I feel complete. I don't feel like I need Christ. You say, you know, I should be miserable, but I don't. But how many people that have walked around with high blood pressure have said the same thing until it was diagnosed? 
I feel fine. And then they hook you up to a machine and you discover that even though you felt fine, you're not fine. And so if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, and even if you feel fine, it's just like the guy walking around with high blood pressure. The thing to do today is to turn to Jesus. And if you believe that He died on the cross for your sins and you're ready to accept Him as your Lord and as your Savior, then you're ready to come and be baptized. He'll wash away all of your sins. You can start nourishing yourself on true food and true drink and start breathing the life that God has given to you. If you've already turned to Jesus, then keep your focus on Him. And believe and remember this passage that His divine power has given us Everything we need for life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. We're going to go ahead and sing a song this morning. And if you need to respond to the invitation, please come as we stand and sing.